This is the Burrow House, a plantation home in Tiny Stateburg, South Carolina, about 10 miles west of Sumter. It has been the site of many Forrest Gump-like moments. General Thomas Sumter lived here, former Governor Stephen Miller lived here, Joel Poinsett, for whom the Poinsettia is named, died here, even Samuel Maverick, whose son became the namesake for the term independent rebel, owned this house on the property. A lot of really important but not splashy historic people have wandered through here. Perhaps the quietest of them all has arguably the most important story to tell. It began here in 1935 when three young girls discovered a stack of letters while playing in the basement of this home. Those letters, now held at USC's Carolinaana Library, tell the story of a slave named April. There's been a really good job of whitewashing a very awkward discussion. It's a hugely awkward discussion. In 1802, a white plantation owner named William Ellison lent one of his young slaves, April, to work for a gin maker in Winsboro. April quickly became the go-to man for repairing the expensive cotton gins throughout the Sumter area. They send him out to the plantations and they'd take them apart. He would sharpen them on location. And that's why he heard about Stateburg. He came through here as a young man. You know, he said, well, when he bought his freedom or whatever, he came here. The center of plantation country, the wealthiest area of South Carolina. He changed his name. April was now known as William Ellison, the name of his former white owner. His gin business prospered. He bought this home, hundreds of acres of land, and eventually 68 slaves to work that land. Granger McCoy now lives in the Ellison home and says he often finds old cotton gin blades. What do the Ellison say when they come? They're looking for the home place. All descendants of what many of us thought an impossible oxymoron, a black slave owner. I had a black ophthalmologist come through here, Ellison, and we sat on this couch right here. And his great-great-granddaddy owned 68 slaves, and here I am, white, over here, and my great-great-granddaddy didn't own any slaves. And it, it was like a, uh, somebody blew a dog whistle in a kennel, everybody was just kind of turning their head, not knowing how to handle all this. History tumbles you. And what little we can learn about Ellison as a slave owner isn't pretty. The book Black Masters chronicles Ellison's life in the antebellum South and suggests that his slaves were the worst fed and clothed of any in Stateburg. It also suggests that Ellison was a slave breeder, selling off infant girls, a practice even some white owners found cruel. Whatever the case, Ellison certainly had a good relationship with other white aristocracy. This contract shows that Ellison didn't just buy a home in wealthy Stateburg, he bought it directly from former Governor Stephen Miller a governor and former slave trading property. He was the wealthiest black man in South Carolina, the fourth wealthiest in the South, wealthier than more than 90 percent of whites. Just a few hundred yards from the Ellison home is the Ellison graveyard, private, neither mixed with other white nor black tombstones, symbolic of his unusual position in the pre-war South, a position so few of us even knew existed. Whatever happened during Reconstruction and then up through the Jim Crow era, anything and everything that had to deal with the relationships between the blacks and the whites just went underground. And may have remained so, if not for a stack of letters found under his house. For Hidden Columbia, Anderson Burns, ABC Columbia News.